Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, Florida, North America's first place city. In this, in this episode and the current chapter, we're going to be talking about cemeteries. And Pensacola itself is very fortunate in that it has two wonderful historic cemeteries of great size, plus, of course, Barrancas National Cemetery, where so many military veterans and heroes are interred. But today we want to talk about the meaning behind cemeteries, and then, of course, what, cemetery, what Pensacola has made of its two wonderful cemeteries, St. Michael's and St. John's. It's a little difficult to take these in any kind of sequence, but we're going to try to do that, establish First of all, what uh, burial customs have been over the course of time, the life of this community, and then a little bit more about the specifics of what is in each of the cemeteries, and then what some of those symbolisms mean. Now, taking it back to the very beginning, we all recognize that from the time of the beginnings of uh, society, uh, respect for the dead has been a major cultural element in almost every society. Uh, the way the dead were cared for, uh, where they were interred, the respect that was given to them, uh, the fact that uh, ancestor worship was considered a, a major part of some civilization. That's all part of, of history, and we've accepted an, 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 and used a little bit of that, of course, here in Pensacola as well. Now, uh, what is a cemetery? Well, by definition, uh, some call it a sleeping place. Uh, the Greeks uh, had a word for it. They called it komian, and that was meant to put, that defined r rather roughly went to be put to sleep. So basically, it is a sleeping place. Now, looking at uh, Pensacola and this area it's, the, itself, we know very little about what the uh, burial practices were up until the time of our British uh, friends who arrived here in 1763. At that point, the British established a new cemetery. It was to the west of what we today call Spring Street and very close to the water's edge. And that was where the interments were made through the ba balance of the British period and then into the, uh, last, the final Spanish period and then about 1800. Uh, some bad things began to happen. Uh, wh why this was the case, I don't know. But they began to have <clears throat> a greater wave action coming in off of the bay, and this was disturbing uh, interments within the cemetery itself. And so the Spanish government said, well, we've, we've got to do something about that. We've got to do better. And so a request was made to, first of all, to a, the surveyor. Uh, the surveyor that we had here at that time was named Vincente Pintado, and Mr. Pintado took his instruments and did a study on the east side of the city, uh, well up from the bay. And Mr. Pintado laid out a plan for a 28-acre cemetery. And this was sent to uh, by ship, of course, to the Spanish Council in Madrid, and they approved the plan. So about 1808, St. Michael's Cemetery came into being. Now, the, the term San Miguel uh, had been adopted by the Spanish as early as 1742. Uh, they had, uh, when they had following a hurricane which had affected them on uh, Santa Rosa Island, uh, the governor of that time had moved a, a team across to uh, basically where Palafox Street would uh, imp impact the bay today, and they had put up a fort which they called San Miguel. And so from that point forward, uh, St. Michael became a part not only of the, the uh, military uh, uh, establishment here, but also it, became, it was established and, and, uh, and uh, or taken over, if you will, by the Catholic Church. And this became St. Michael's Parish. Now, uh, some people said, well, let's not overlook the fact that who was St. Michael? St. Michael was one of the seven archangels, as they appear, of course, in the Old Testament, and the, uh, the Catholic Church has uh, lived by that ever since. And when St. Michael's Cemetery began, it was placed in the charge of the Catholic Church parish here. Now, the, to begin with, there were 28 acres, but they hadn't gone well, about half a dozen years when, they, when people in the town said, well, that we've got, that, that's valuable property. We don't have to uh, allocate all of that to a cemetery. So they sold off more than half of it. Dr. John Brosenham, one of the physicians of the day, was the purchaser of a considerable part of it. But nonetheless, the cemetery continued in use uh, in the other eight acres. Now, 
we have to look a little bit at what burial custom was like back in those days. Uh, was, uh, if we look at what we do, or many people do in the 21st century, and then compare what was happening back then, there are, of course, similarities, but there were differences. Now, in the, uh, in the early part of, the, uh, of this, of this uh, period of St. Michael's, basically a, a family would handle a, a, a burial basically like this. There, there was no such thing as a funeral director. Basically, the, the, the uh, deceased would be placed in a plain uh, wooden pine box and usually they would have a wake or a, a viewing, if we want to call it that, in the family home. And this would be, of course, attended by, by, by mourners and they would be people who would be coming in there just to pay their respects. And it was then, probably, that the custom arose of having friends and others provide some food to assist the family because they were so, uh, so much tied up with other details. Now, the, the idea of mourning uh, began to take on a, a kind of a, a, almost a liturgy. And we can apply this going forward in the, in the 19th century this way. First of all, we, we, today we use the term pallbearer. And today we say a pallbearer, well, he's the, one of those people who, who uh, uh, carry the, uh, the casket from the, the hearse to the, uh, the place of interment. But that, that was not the, the way the term was originally taken. The, the, back in the, uh, in the early part of the 19th century and beyond, the term pall meant the covering, the black covering that went over the top of the casket. And the pallbearer at that point in time was the one, one or more persons who carried the black covering the, the, uh, the, the fabric itself. The undercarrier was the man, or the men rather, who, who literally carried the, the, uh, the casket or the box itself from the home to the, to the, to the, on the way to the, to the cemetery. Now, uh, transporting the, the remains, of course, was certainly not done, in the, well, not in exactly the same way we have it today. In those days, basically a, a wagon or a cart was, the, was, in, was used and the, the casket was placed on that and the pall was placed over the top of that uh, of the casket itself en route and of course the burial took place with a with a uh, religious service at graveside now the the, uh, the the people who went into mourning and of course the, this these customs would, would change a little bit as we went forward in that last century but basically mourning what became a very respected thing the the widow for example always wore black and she would wear black in, 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 as her garb uh, entirely for a period of two years if it was her if the deceased was her husband if it was a child or other relative usually that was restricted to just one year uh, the man involved the, the widow if it was, if he became a widower he wore black as well a black hat black clothes and he if he wore he used a cane he also had some sort of little black uh, 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 article of cloth that he carried around it to illustrate that he was in mourning in those days the, uh, gradually the custom began of uh, illustrating or uh, 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 alerting the community or the, the neighbors to the fact that there was a death a wreath would be hung on the door and that illustrated yes we have we've we've suffered a loss in our in our household here now of course many people uh, this was particularly true after 1870 as the community grew and, and people wanted to alert uh, friends and business associates of what had happened. People began to develop little cards, little uh, sympathy, uh, little statement cards, uh, always with a black rim around it that they would, it was almost like a postcard except that it was of course put inside an envelope and mailed, but this would tell friends uh, uh, perhaps away from the community that so and so had passed away. Uh, if, the, uh, if this was a business, uh, often they did not use a card but rather wrote a, uh, had printed a special letter, a uh, letter form, I should say, with, which had the same black uh, uh, side around it. Now, uh, many times uh, uh, the death was, was a, a kind of an announcement. It became very popular in the, uh, in the period right after the war between the states to have a piece of art made for them. This was a, a little painting that would have a, a scene, if you will, that, that illustrates something, illustrated something that was uh, uh, something that the, the deceased was very uh, uh, interested in, and that little painting would be, would be uh, reproduced and sent to people. And also some women uh, who were, uh, who were members, of, members of the family, but not necessarily the widow, they would have made little woven bracelets of a, what the people called a, a grieving bracelet, and people would wear these for six, eight, ten months to illustrate that a death had taken place. Well, we move into the, into the middle part of the, uh, of the uh, 19th century, and things begin to change. By the time we get to the, to the after the Civil War, we begin to have the presence in our community of, uh, of undertakers. Now, I want to stress another point. Uh, the, the original casket that was used here, as I, I think we mentioned earlier, was a plain wooden 
box. But by the time we move into the late 40s, it became much more fashionable to have a, a, a much more custom-made casket. They, these became far more ornate. Uh, usually they were made with, with wood, of course, of wood, but often they would have other forms of, uh, of uh, embroidery on the outside. And that, this is when they began to put a, a satin type or, or cloth cushioning inside the casket itself to make the, uh, the deceased look more comfortable. And this, of course, was then the, when they began to dress the, the deceased much more carefully so that the, the person would pass into his, uh, his time of reward in his best, uh, more f formal clothes. And of course, and as they did this, they were looking back to what the people had done far back, way back into Egyptian times, where, of course, the deceased pharaohs and others were so, so lavishly uh, costumed as they went uh, into their resting place. Okay. The, uh, as we came into the, uh, into the, eight, uh, 19, in the 1880s, uh, first of all, John Campbell became a, our first undertaker. Then the firm of, uh, of Woods and Underwood became the, the uh, principal undertakers. And they were followed by a man named Frank Pugh. Now, Frank Pugh was a little bit of everything in the community. He operated the livery stable. He operated the, uh, a blacksmith shop. But he also, he was one of the first people to, to provide a, a fashionable hearse. And Frank Pugh was a, uh, also put together what we would today call a funeral chapel or funeral parlor, and it was he that probably was the one who began encouraging families to, to have their viewing there rather than in the, in the family living room, although that certainly was not a universal thing, so, because we still had many cases of very prominent people whose viewings were in the family home, and this would go uh, almost up to the time of World War II. The, the, uh, Frank Pugh uh, went into partnership a little bit later. He, went, uh, he was joined by a man named William Fisher, and uh, Mr. Fisher, of course, was one of the city's most prominent attorneys. He also went into the insurance business, and uh, uh, William Fisher was, well, he got his, his fingers in just about every, everything you can think of. And when these two came together, of course, they became the firm of Fisher Pew, and uh, that organization, that firm still exists and is servicing the community today. All right, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the other things that, that, that we want to see in a cemetery. And we'll, we will talk about funerary art a little bit later. A cemetery itself is a resting place, but also it has been common for, for centuries in many, in many cultures to place a, a symbol there uh, at, the, at the place of, uh, of the burial that illustrated who the person was and told a little bit about them. And also they began to put together, uh, people put, began to put together different forms of burial. Now, sometimes the burial form uh, had to do with, with geography. For example, over near New Orleans, the water table is such that it is almost impossible to have a and under uh, a burial below the earth's surface. And consequently, they began to build what we would they call above ground vaults, uh, ceremonial vaults. And the vaults were very, rather unique. They were of some size and built of such uh, uh, durability that the family that, that, that spent the, the considerable sum to put it together recognized that this wasn't going to be a burial place for just one person. This would be for a succession of, uh, of burials for a, the immediate family and then well into the future because it became uh, accepted custom after a time when the, when the remains had become only a series of, of uh, skeletal bones. Those skeletal bones were moved aside in a, in a very, uh, a very uh, cherished way, of course, and room was made for still another casket and another burial. Burial. And so we begin to see that form of burial here in, uh, in uh, St. Michael's Cemetery. Along the way, uh, a number of the more, the more prestigious families here, the, the Morenos, the Gonzales, the Williams, the, uh, Dorothy Walton, the, the famed lady of, uh, Declar of Declaration of Independence time, all of these people had individual uh, above-ground vaults of that time. And they, of course, are, are part of the story of St. Michael's because it makes it unique. When we come to the story of St. John's, we find only one such above-ground vault there. Other kinds of vaults, of course, are quite different. Uh, some of these, uh, in the original form, uh, when a person was buried, they simply dug the, the conventional six-foot uh, depth uh, grave site and put the, the casket in there. But then as we moved a little bit forward, uh, people were anxious to be a little bit more uh, uh, careful of the remains and consequently they would build a, a, a retaining uh, concrete uh, vault or box underneath and the casket would go in there. But more of our story of uh, burials when we return next time.